Good morning. Today we are going to talk about this paper, Evaluation of Software Impact Design for Biomedical Research. Are we measuring what's meaningful? So uh, for the intro, first we have that biomedical software is critical for biomedical research. I think there, there is no doubt here. So it was initially developed for personal use and now we're seeing that sharing benefits the community. So they share the software with the hopes that uh, the use of this by others will also contribute to advances uh, of science and healthcare. So why software evaluation? Well, it's crucial to improve a, its use and impact um, and can give us uh, two major benefits. One is uh, to inform the developers about how to improve the use and how it ultimately impacts uh, to the users. And second, to demonstrate the value of the tool to support, uh, to obtain funding for the developers and to continue supporting existing software and creating new software as well. And one of the most common metrics are the uh, included number of the new users, uh, the returning users, the total downloads, and for example, in some cases, downloads by count version. But this is not enough because uh, proper metrics uh, should not only examine the software performance, but assess whether the motivations and goals of the researchers who are using the software are being met. So that's why we need to gather information and not just any kind of information, but the proper information about the downstream impact of the tool. I guess uh, I'll take it like that. <laughs> and for the first table, we have the common metrics. Uh, the most common ones are these ones, who are the total unique downloads, the new users, the returning users, and the download by count versions. But this can only measure the tool dissemination and to determine the popularity of a given tool. But we can have many other uh, uh, aims, for example, to measure the tool usefulness, the tool re reliability, the tool versatility, the acceptability of the interface and the performance. And for that, we can use other kind of metrics like uh, the number of software engagements by user to determine the prevalence of the usage, the proportion of runs without crash or error to probably uh, improving uh, error handling and fixing bugs. Uh, this is more for the uh, the new usage of the of the tool. For example, there are tools that were created for just one field and have been adapted to other fields. So for example, here we can improve the tool flexibility and generalizability. And for the uh, acceptability of the graphical tool and website, uh, we can measure, for example, the proportion of visitors who actually engage with the tool, not just that don't last the tool. And also it's common to uh, measure the user error frequency. Um, I think I'm gonna present like this because I don't know, it's not loading the, the images. But okay, now we go to the assessment of attitudes and practices for somewhere uh, for software in impact evaluation. And for this, uh, they performed two analysis. The first was a survey to understand the developed activities and practices. This was done in the, within the community of developers of the Informatics Technology for Cancer Research, ITCR. And uh, that is a program funded by the National Cancer Institute, the NCI. So with this, they aim to, to understand how the developers think about the software evaluation by performing the survey. And then they assess uh, the implemented infrastructure and its impact of software evaluation. Uh, also manually inspected uh, 44 software tools. And we have some uh, tables later. So for the survey analysis, they survey 48 participants. Uh, and they identified 
that the major barriers to performing software impact evaluation were uh, in first place, the limited time. Uh, this survey uh, didn't have just one uh, possible answer. It could be different answers. So that's why the percentage are like that. And then the, uh, other constraint is the fundings. Then the privacy concern, the technical issues, and the lack of knowledge about evaluation methods. Then for the funding support, they have uh, got into the conclusion that current funding mechanisms like ITCR program and Chance Zuckerberg initiatives are in insufficient. And we need more funding to support uh, software sustainability. But there were also benefits for the software evaluation because despite the challenges, uh, the, evolu uh, the person who had the survey informed when they did practice this, the, they had new developmental ideas. Uh, there were um, increases and they had better documentation and they could also justify funding in a better way. But there are also some challenges and goals. Uh, for example, the collaboration tracking, the commercial applica application usage, the user base fraction, the downstream activity, and the user fr frustration. These uh, things are things that can't be measured, but the people would like to measure, just don't know how still. And then for the infrastructure analysis, they uh, use uh, manually inspected the 44 software tools. Uh, these uh, software tools were divided by um, its uh, characteristics with, uh, yeah. And for example, we have uh, plugin extensions, uh, Jupyter Python, database ontology, uh, computing platforms, web-based tools, desktop application or command line tools, and R packages. With uh, the R packages were the most of them. And for example, uh, inspected infrastructure relating to knowing about the tool and how to use it. Uh, software health metrics, how is the software being cured and updated? Uh, associated aspect with increased usage. Uh, presence on social media, the one that they uh, focused in here was Twitter. Uh, the badges indicating uh, software health metrics and that are visible to the users and extensive documentation and feedback mechanisms. So uh, it was seen that all of these uh, are correlated with a more increased usage of the tool. And for the usage evaluation, they used a software PMC database that is a database that contains information about software tools mentioned in, in scientific literature. It is specially focused on software tools uh, mentioned in articles indexed in the PubMed Central database, but this did not include a citation to tool, but rather plain text, plain text mentions inferred by a text mining algorithm. So uh, the database do, does not know anything about these tools per se, and this all these mentions could not necessarily uh, correspond to the same tool. And they give us the example of Dana, then it's an ITCR tool for microRNA analysis, but there are also unrelated methods with the same names. Uh, so they give us the, the example uh, that in the other hand, tools with uh, highly specific names like Bioconductor are unlikely to have the same issue and they urge us to do this, to don't use the same names for every tool. And so, here we have uh, the mentioned aspects of software in infrastructure that appear to be associated with a large number of published manuscripts for um, 
from users describing the, the usage of the tool. So when you have a better documentation depth, when you have a better, in this case, Twitter presence, uh, when you have better contact methods, and when you have a present of software health metrics and that are visible to the users, you can get better citation of your, of your tool. Okay, now they will give us like um, uh, overall guidance. So they tell us that successful evaluation are anchored by an understanding of the intended use of the software. Uh, so the computational tools are designed to support well-defined goals and they uh, are often called use cases. And it are for a specific, a specific set of users that are called personas. So we need to evaluate the impacts of tools uh, guided by a clear understanding of these use cases and also to the personas to assess how well the tools meet the intended goals. We can just uh, say this tool is good or bad if we don't know uh, what do we want it to work for and who do we want to work it for. Uh, they give us for, uh, an example. Uh, for example, when you have a medical device, uh, so if you have a, a software that is aiming to contribute to the treating, diagnosis, or prevention of a medical condition, it might qualify as a medical device. So as a medical device, it would need to have, uh, it would require a clinical validation. So the different things that your tool may need are based on what is it used for and who is it uh, aimed to. And for the metric selection, they tell us uh, it should be hypothesis driven. So um, collecting uh, an extensive amount of data and then selecting uh, metrics can add some complexity and increase the risk that the metrics uh, are selected in a biased manner is not as good as just having all the data and then uh, figuring out what to do with them. So uh, hypothesis-driven metrics can be selected ahead of time based on a specific hypothesis to ultimately evaluate how well the software supports its intended goal. So we should have uh, in mind what do we want to measure before measuring it. Uh, intentions for evaluation can also inform the design choice. So software can also be designed with future evaluations in mind, not just uh, the tool per se. And this is uh, in accordance with the last point that we should collect the right data. Uh, they give us an example again of uh, Sheena that is a tool intended to enable, uh, to visualize uh, various aspects of the genome. And for example, the developers collect metrics involved, involving um, how often the users use the tool to do these visualizations, but uh, for privacy uh, considerations, uh, they do not collect the metrics about what part of the genome uh, gets visualized, only the times it gets visualized. Uh, also, metrics can achieve different goals for different audiences. Uh, this is important uh, that we have a clear understanding uh, of the use cases, uh, personas, and audiences of interest, because uh, it's not the same to give, a, for example, a detailed metric of the inner working of software tool than just uh, demonstrating that a uh, tool is widely used or widely accepted. Uh, for the first one, developers might be interested uh, in detailed metrics for the tool optimizations, and it might be highly informative for the developers. 
but maybe such metrics would be uh, too much for the interest of funding agency. They don't want to know these kind of things. So um, also external audiences might be more interested in evidence for impact. Um, this often uh, requires that uh, resource, um, yeah, that uh, they be able to demonstrate that a tool is widely used and widely accepted, and also to encourage users to adopt a tool more readily and to be more invested in a tool community. This can be also related with the social media engagement. And the demonstration of the impact can recruit new users and this can lead to uh, the diversify of the tool communities. And for example, you can bring a new problem of interest and expand the utility of the tool. So next, uh, no single evaluation method works for every type of software. Uh, there are a lot of different uh, issues as I think uh, software uh, health, for example, uh, using version control system, high coverage of code with testing and use of automated or continuous integration are one of the broadest uh, assessment you can make, but not all tools uh, would imply this uh, and these uh, things, because for example, um, a lot of them are just downloaded once, once, and then um, they can be downloaded by the institution and not by individual person. So it is not, yeah, it's not a good idea to generalize in these kind of things. Um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. Uh, and metrics uh, should be in interpret. Uh, the metrics are not just uh, general, as you might uh, already uh, heard. The metric selection should be hypothesis driven because if not, we just have a bunch of data and then uh, the interpretation could be not just more difficult, but also wrong. For example, this has to do with the, the previous point where uh, different kinds of evaluations can lead to different kind of uh, data types that we have and that we can interpret. So then uh, the software infrastructure enables uh, impact evaluation. And for that, we have a little table which uh, can divide us uh, needs into internal and external. Uh, then we have uh, an, a specific goal and we have different benefits. For example, uh, an internal need would be the tool optimization. This would be um, for the developers and the specific goals could be improving uh, workflows, improving performance, improving, improving usage, improving implementations or usability. And for that, um, we can do different uh, kind of measures. But lastly, the, they have uh, a lot of benefits. Uh, for example, in the usage, that is uh, one of the most um, common one is to identify software errors, identify what features are used and are not used, uh, who, are, who the user base is, the user base diversity, uh, sources for other possible users, uh, what the user expectations are, uh, if the user's expectations are appropriate for your tool, and evaluate the success of out, out, sorry, outreach approaches. <clears throat> so for example, in here, the external need would be to gain support, to gain user commitment, 
or gain community uh, development. And this can also be supported by uh, other things like uh, held badges that are visible for the users, like um, uh, social media engagement. Yeah, the internal needs has to do more with how do we measure what we want to measure, how we interpret it, and the external needs has to do more with uh, how do we let uh, the users know that it's uh, a tool appropriate for them or a good tool. Then um, the software project health metrics can reassure users and funders. But we had said before, uh, a lot of elements uh, can make uh, users to be confident using the tools. Uh, for example, uh, you can have different elements like web presence, uh, citability, contact, using use, usability testing, uh, workshops, social, social media, and reviews. Uh, for this, we have uh, different options uh, in order if it's a web-based tool or a documentation website. Uh, for citability, there is also an issue that we will address later. But for example, providing uh, something to cite, like a DOI or a manuscript, can be very useful and can make uh, people cite your tool more. Uh, for contact, uh, also seeing that is uh, is correlated with a more broad use of your tool. Uh, should uh, have uh, feedback mechanisms, should uh, maybe have discussion forums, and maybe new seller emails. But the most important is the uh, feedback mechanism. Uh, for usability testings, uh, we can observe um, a few people uh, use the tool or not. So for example, this could be uh, some screen sharing and recording. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, for workshops, for example, uh, if they are online or in person and the basic of the new features, basic or new features, uh, the social media, they have only uh, presented us Twitter, but we can have YouTube videos, uh, Twitter, uh, Mastodon, Instagram, LinkedIn, and whatever you can think of. And for the review, uh, we have here review forums, and later we will also address a kind of um, new proposal that they give us. So yeah, the metrics uh, related to software quality and reusability could reassure users and funders also. So with all of this, we know that um, the software held uh, infrastructure enables collecting metrics that can reassure users and also funders. Here we uh, have uh, infrastructure divided into version control, testing, or licensing. For the version control, we have different options. For example, uh, without automatization and with automatization. For the testing, we could have also uh, automate testing. And for the licensee, um, there are a variety of licenses uh, that exist that allow or disallow the reuse and that require attribution. So now we go to the citation challenges and nuances. That is one of the uh, most um, challenging <laughs> issue in, in this uh, usage, um, tool usage and how to track it. Because uh, measuring uh, the number of citations is especially useful uh, as a metric to report to funding agencies. 
but uh, to be in uh, to be able to do that is necessary that first your tool has a manuscript or other data object to cite, for example, the DOI in the web ones. Um, uh, a manuscript um, for print, for example, is a is a, a citable presence. You should have a citable presence. So other challenges are that, for example, um, tools which provide system architecture for other software may not be typically cited. Uh, for example, here we have again the example of Bioconductor which uh, provides system architecture for other software, but is not uh, usually cited. And yeah, other issue is that many tools are used in the discovery phase of a project, but not in the in different stages of the project. So it are not cited. And for example, like um, many users uh, may acknowledge your tool, but may not cite the tool in the reference section of the paper. And they may mention the tool without complete information. Mm -hmm. So having the complete information is also um, important and you may help the users in having this information in sight all time. So uh, for this, they give us um, a little uh, example that um, a study that manually evaluated software citations of uh, 4,971 academic bioinformaticals and economical articles found that the citation only included version information only the 28% of the time. <laughs> so another study also that manually evaluated uh, 90 biology articles find a uh, low rate of complete information uh, where only the 20% of the time the URL information included. <clears throat> so uh, all the mentions are very difficult to track so now we have, for example, uh, different uh, number of tools that can help measure citations. And some tools are being developed, developed to help track software mentions. Uh, an example of this is the development of automatic extraction methods to overcome these uh, kind of challenges and also additional challenges because there can be a uh, disambiguity uh, between multiple syn synonyms for the same native software, as we have seen before. They can be uh, typographic errors or misspelling, uh, the use of acronyms versus full names, and um, the way that the user captured the information. Um, yeah, for the distortion uh, metrics, we have a uh, uh, a nice table <laughs> here. So the distortion of the metrics could be for an accidental usage. So they uh, didn't just, um, yeah, it's, um, it's not measuring the real usage. So you want to measure only the real usage, not the accidental one. The background usage, for example, there may be a background level of downloads across all the packages in Bioconductor, but you are not specifically uh, downloading the, the specific tool. It's just uh, a package. Uh, technical versus uh, research usage is not the same as if you use it for technical and not biological reasons, and if, if you use it for them and the uses persi um, usage persistence. Uh, so uh, it's not the same time to use it once that use it a lot of times. 
So this kind of things should be measured. Uh, then we have uh, clinical data challenges. Uh, the clinical data challenges are uh, a lot because often they contain highly sensitive uh, protected health information called PHI. So for example, the number of individuals that have access to the data is generally much smaller than the tool designed uh, to work with non-clinical data. And for example, it would not be realistic to compare uh, usage metrics to more widely available and accessible tools. There's a greater control over the access of PHI. So we should adapt this to only, for example, the clinical data, not to compare it with other kind of tools. Uh, an example they give is the Emmers GitHub repository that uh, although is open source, now is private. And they say this uh, encourage a, a better understanding of who is interested in using it. And also um, only no entities have access to this software and it can also prevent uh, malicious intentions. And yeah, now we have uh, the good horse law. <laughs> this law uh, states that um, every measure which becomes a target becomes a bad measure. And they give us uh, the example of the H indices, the number of paper uh, an author has with uh, more or many citations. And for example, uh, this, were, this was used to assess the quality of an author's impact. But uh, this has led that the H index grew in popularity. So the number of researchers that were included as co-authors, the number of citations of the paper and the fraction of cell citation increased. So now we're not seeing the quality of an author's impact. We are distorting it. And for... Uh, Last, we have security, legal, and ethical considerations. Uh, with this, uh, occasionally, uh, the software developers will not will notify the, the users that they're being tracked. Uh, but many times, this is not a requirement. But now, um, there are uh, different uh, guidelines that we should um, stick to. For example, we have the GDPR that um, so there are also other international regulations that may impact uh, the data collections of users. So they propose that one option is to let users determine if they wish to be tracked uh, or also to um, uh, develop a way to design tracking to be more anonymous, like the um, one of the examples before where you could see uh, how many times the tool was used, but not what part of the genomes you were seeing. So uh, the ethical and legal consequences should be considered when designing or implementing a tracking system of any kind of scientific software. And yeah, for the discussion and the conclusions, uh, you can see that software is vital for the advancement of biology and medicine. The analysis of usage and impact metrics help determine uh, users and community engagement. The metrics justify additional funding. They encourage more users uh, to use your tool and they could identify unanticipated, unanticipated use cases so you can broaden your tool. Uh, challenges can include uh, distorted, exaggerated or understated metrics as well as ethical and security concerns. Uh, there is a need for more attention to these nuances and challenges. Uh, across the diverse biological software. Uh, 
and there is not a single perfect metric or approach that exists. It depends entirely on each tool's unique aspects and usage. That is one of the most important points. Uh, it gives us proposed guidelines and strategy for software evaluations and resources. Um, yeah, well, this is more kind of a resume of what was here. And um, a final point that I would like to uh, tell you is that they gave us this proposal of, for example, using a reward based system and um, a kind of different paper for acknowledging that the tools are being in constant um, uh, surveillance and they are being developed not just entirely from scratch, but they are being cured. So this could also give us uh, better uh, tools for citing and also for not uh, letting tools to get obsolete and having a uh, recognizement for the people who are working in the tools. So thank you. Here is the, <laughs> the reference. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa.